Hey everybody, welcome to the Growing with Fishes podcast. I'm Steve. And uh, today we have Adam Cohen from Green Phoenix Farms. He was kind enough to join us today. I want to say hi. Good evening. <laughs> and uh, Marty will be joining us in a bit. He had a um, family obligation at the moment. Um, he wasn't able to join us right at the start, but he will be joining us in a few. Um, today we have a whole bunch of important topics. The DEA has decided to go completely batshit crazy this week, which we'll, complete, we'll get into. Um, there's a whole bunch of new law, rules and regulations and regarding the uh, DEA extracts and a whole bunch of other things that uh, kinds of headaches for an innumerable number of people. And yeah, it'll be fun to talk about later. Um, so re um, right now we have a, um, I've had a whole bunch of stuff going on. We're uh, just getting Eden all situated, planning out our new set of greenhouses and uh, getting our, our out, some outdoor uh, soil beds running just to get some winter crops going. And um, that's about all I've had going on. We have a few other things in the works. I have uh, Hopefully we'll have a little short video from you, for you guys on Saturday. Um, a little short live video depending on what I can get, uh, what's going on with something pretty you guys will all like. And um, yeah, I can't really tell you much more on it, but I'll show you. <laughs> so... Um, uh, what we'll do today is um, uh, Adam's going to talk to us. Adam is from uh, Green Phoenix Farms. Um, if you guys are interested in learning more, um, you can go to the description in the in the um, of the podcast there and uh, take you to a link directly to his website. Um, he has a uh, heads up a large commercial aquaponics farm where they do lettuce and a bunch of other products. Um, vegetables and things like that. He has a lot of uh, years of experience working on the commercial scale. He's also the uh, um, president or vice president. Um, is it the president? Chairman. Uh, chairman, chairman. The chairman of, uh, of the Aquaponics Association, and uh, which is the largest um, this group of aquaponics um, affiliated uh, companies in the United States and uh, as well as the world. Um, and uh, he was kind enough to join us today. Thanks for having me. So why don't you tell us about um, you know, uh, your farm and what it is that you specialize in growing? Okay. Well, uh, let's see. Uh, Green Phoenix Farms was really just kind of a, a way for me to go further down the path of aquaponics when I started about eight years ago. And my background is education. So I've done teaching for 15 years. And when I started Green Phoenix, we, we started doing community workshops in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And we just started teaching the people around us what we knew about aquaponics, which admittedly at that point was, but like a lot of us that have been doing it, we've made more mistakes and learn from them and then made new ones and just kept learning. So the, the purpose of Green Phoenix at this point is mostly education training and providing the, the quality materials that are needed to, to build systems. So uh, my father, David, has, has been working with me for um, six, six years now. And we actually we recently just split the, the business uh, in half. He actually is taking the commercial farm that's there in Dallas-Fort Worth uh, down in Burleson, Texas, and he's going to be running that. Um, and I'm taking the rest and just kind of going a new direction. So to massively change for Green Phoenix come the new year, I'm looking forward to, to the new direction. But uh, mostly we're going to providing better education and better information to everyone that is looking to do DIY style. So. Very cool. So what are some of the crops that you guys special in there at Green Phoenix Farms? Uh, we've, we've actually played around with things. Um, our our production systems were never very large, honestly. Uh, 
The system that David's running now is about uh, 1,500 square feet. He's in the process of building a new 2,000 square foot greenhouse alongside, and that's going to be running a, a small scale CSA for the local for the local uh, community. But mostly, since for the for the first six years, Green Phoenix focused on on education. We grew everything and anything we could think of, and just kind of shared what our results were, how it how it grew, what pests, uh, fruit yield, harvest yield, all, and just try to figure out how to grow different things in outdoor systems in Texas through the summer. So it's it's been interesting. We've grown. Like I said, just about everything that I can think of. Is there any uh, particular varieties you'd recommend in, uh, being in a warmer climate like you are, especially with the higher temperature summers? Uh, what are some of the varieties you found that are a little more heat tolerant or specialized, I guess, with that in mind? Um, well, through the Texas summer, we actually, uh, a lot of the things did great. Um, I mean, obviously, things like cucumbers, melons, okra, uh, we we couldn't we couldn't keep them under control. They just took over everything that we tried to plant them in. Uh, I mean, tomatoes always gave us trouble uh, with with the the fruit set issues and and ninety five plus, but we found um, really good success in our outdoor systems. Uh, using cherry tomatoes and uh, like the yellow pear tomatoes and the real small grapes, um, we'd get amazing uh, fruit set out of those all summer long, even when temperatures were up into the 100 plus, 110, uh, we'd still get great fruit set, great percentage. Uh, Lettuce still looking to find a great lettuce that performs really well in hot weather. But uh, my new favorite summer crop for a, 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 a green is Malabar spinach. It's it's absolutely my favorite. The thing grows like mad, and it is then then spinach. It has more vitamin C, more iron than just. About anything, and it grows. So it's a great crop. Other than that, that's great. I uh, grew Malbar spinach for the first time last year, and I couldn't agree more. I had a real, real good luck. Sorry about that. I had a little bit of a skip there. I think it's on my end. The couple times I've grown. Any insect issues? The first two years I grew Malabar, I didn't have any problem. Last year I grew a, just a massive infestation of aphids in it. And what uh, what are some of your recommended um, aphid controls for aquaponics? Uh, steady stream out of a garden hose, just spray the plants down and wash the aphids off. Um, but if I can't do that, uh, diatomaceous earth and, and safer soap are probably my favorites. Um, I, I tried diatomaceous earth for years and it worked okay on the aphids, but in Texas we had fire ants that would do a system and would start farming the aphids. And they were able to to take care of uh, the aphids, so the the DE the didn't do anything. But the safer soap works great; it, it just knocks them out. That's great. Have you ever tried a product called Kapow um, or a, a, any other products that have like a lemongrass castor oil mix? No, I haven't heard of those. Kapow. Um, All right, I gotta gotta check that one out. That's a really good one. You can also um, use it even um, on, uh, you know, very delicate plants. You can mix it down to it like a nine to one um, concentrate to water, uh, and um, yeah, it'll work down up to that. Even for mites, um, even in late flower, depending on what you're growing. But 
Um, it's a, one of the better, more natural, um, less um, aggressive uh, pest controls. But uh, it's great to hear. I've used the Safer Soap as well. And the Safer Soap is another great option for people to use. Yeah, it, it's, I recommend Safer Soap a lot of times just as a, as a general, if you're only going to buy one insecticide, so forth, Safer Soap is, is a pretty simple one to use. And it, it takes care of a, a wide variety in my experience. So it's a good one. That's great. Um, so do you want to tell us more about the Aquaponics Association for people that aren't as familiar as you and I with the, with the industry? Sure. So the association was founded five years ago by Sylvia Bernstein and uh, Gina Caviero. Um, Sylvia obviously was the founder for the Aquaponics Source, along with uh, Tanya, uh, founded and run Green Acre. Greenacre Aquaponics in Florida. So the two of them, along with uh, a host of other uh, uh, individuals, worked together to found the association a few years or five years ago. And it had the mission promoting the industry. It wasn't, um, some people have said recently that, that the mission of, of the association was to promote organic aquaponics or to promote commercial industry and so forth. And while all of that was was in there and, and definitely an intent, it the purpose of the association was just really to promote aquaponics. And since at that time we were we were also spread out and you know if you were lucky there was one or two other people in within 20, 30 miles of you that, that did aquaponics, this was a way for people to talk together and, and learn. And um, so in the five years, the association has, has gone through a series of growing pains. Um, we just recently, uh, the second week in our fourth annual conference um, in, sorry, fifth annual conference in Austin, Texas. Uh, and it was an absolute blast. We got a chance to go tour Sustainable Harvesters uh, just outside of Houston. Um, they're, a, uh, I think they're 9,000 square feet. I can't remember exactly, but they produce hitting six to 7,000 plants a week, I believe they said. Um, all aquaponic and they're doing, they're just doing some great stuff there. So we got to tour that facility. We got to, who uh, Ken Arnold from Arboros gave the keynote on Saturday gave a great keynote at lunch. Um, and we had speakers from all over. We had uh, speakers from China. We had speakers from all over the U.S., from Canada. It was, it was a great – and then we had elections. So in the electric new executive, board. Um, I was elected chair and crash aquaponic this year. Uh, Ken Armstrong is, is serving at uh, is uh, our secretary. So things are really going to hopefully start <laughs> developing. We have that we're going to launch at the first of the year and just to increase communication, to get information out to people who are doing aquaponics about what's out there or what's available, um, business, where to find resources like funding or help in design or materials, you know, just how to, how to do what we do better, easier, and more efficiently. So that's, that's where we're going commercial farmers. It's for the the high school teacher that wants to do it in the classroom or the the family that wants to cut their grocery bill down or or anyone. If you if you have an interest in aquaponics, we encourage you to join. Um, membership is is forty five dollars a year. It's it's not a massively uh, ex extensive price and over the next year we're gonna be adding a number of uh, benefits to members that uh, 
that was a big part of the conference was we had a, a pretty frank discussion with the membership to say, what do you want? And we got a list and we're going to just start going down that list and providing it as best we can to the members. That's awesome. And where can the people find more information on that? Is it, uh, I believe it's aquaponics uh, association.org, I think is the website. Yes. Yeah, thank you for reminding me. It, it, if you want to learn more, um, our website is, is aquaponicsassociation.org. Um, make sure you put that S in the middle, it's aquaponics. Uh, we're, we're taking, we're working on finalizing the location for the 2017 conference. Um, we've got a couple, a couple of possibilities, but we're hoping that, uh, we'll be able to announce, uh, the location for the 2017 conference. And we really encourage, uh, membership. Uh, if you're interested in aquaponics, it's, it's worth joining like our page on Facebook. Um, and even if you're not a member, you'll get, a, you'll see a lot of what's going on through that page. So at least come take a look and, and be aware of what's going on out there. Wonderful. Um, I know I've had a, um, I've never actually had a chance to go to any of the aquaponics association, um, conventions, but it's different. I would, was hoping to be at the one this year and, uh, had some stuff come up, last, um, and wasn't able to work it out schedule wise, but, uh, I know you guys do a lot for disseminating information. Um, I know you guys did a lot now, uh, I believe the aquaponics association also did a lot for the, the organic stuff. That's been quite mm -hmm. the rage lately. Do you want to touch on that? Yeah, I can speak a little bit to that. Um, um, our policy um, uh, was actually there at the the organic uh, the NOSB uh, hearing meeting that happened in St. Louis uh, uh, actually a few weeks ago, about a week after the, the he was joined by um, uh, the benefits of aquaponics and. Uh, provided a wealth of information along with uh, public comment uh, as to why aquaponics should be allowed or continued allowed, continued to uh, receive organic certification. Um, and the, there's, there's a whole release that will be coming out uh, very quickly about all of this um, more details, but the, the short of it is that the, the, the NOSB couldn't get consensus uh, to, so it is going back to the drawing board and it's going to be uh, more this year. So the, the issue has not yet been settled, but at this point it is, I don't think we're really in danger of losing the ability to get aquaponic systems certified organic so i'm i'm really excited about that yeah it's always nice to see uh when we get a victory in that stuff especially with the uh um not every industry being able to apply for for aquaponics um it's a step in the right or not, not be able to apply for aquaponics not able to be able to apply for organic certification um mm -hmm. it's nice to see some victories in the in that realm and Hopefully we'll be able to get all the crops that grow in the United States uh, to be organically certified. Understood. Yeah, that that'll be that'll be a good day. I mean, it's more the education. It's teaching people that traditional hydroponics is not the same as aquaponics, and the fact that we have a microbial environment that is as diverse and as thriving, if not more so than healthy soil is, it's just an education, but it's coming, so. Now, do you, um, now do you ever use microbial inoculants or anything like that? In my systems, I've, we've never, uh, uh, needed to some the cycling phase so forth is is enough to bring in the 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 bacterial population that makes the system run 
but in terms of, of the education that I was talking about a moment ago, we need to do more research to know what bacteria make up a healthy system. Um, there's been a great deal of research with soil agriculture in the last 10 years to look at exactly what types of bacteria and fungus and, and, and everything else living, live together to make up healthy soil. If we can identify which aquaponic systems are the most productive and then be able to identify the, the microbial uh, fauna that live in those systems, you know, that, that'll give us a better understanding of how systems actually work. But we've got to find the funding to be able to get that to the researchers to do the research and then publish the results. We need to get to a point where the aquaponics industry isn't driven by this idea of, of, of holding everything close to your chest and, and it's, this is my idea, this is my patent, and nobody else gets to use it unless you pay me. Information needs to be released. And while I'm not saying that, that everything should be free, I do think that, that research needs to be prioritized and actually have verifiable information that can be relied on. And it's not just what somebody thinks or at some um, unfounded. We have to have hard data if we're going to be, if we're going to take this to the next level of, of commercial viability. No, I, I agree a hundred percent. Um, that was one of like the most frustrating things coming into aquaponics is the fact that like there was not really, no one really had mapped out like a suggested parts per million nutrient range for a lot of these different nutrients to figure out like, do I have enough? Do I need to supplement? Um, there hasn't mm -hmm. been a whole lot of microbial research. Um, I know that back when I worked at the aquaponics source, we tested a whole bunch of different microbial inoculants. And the one that really made a difference, and especially even post working for them in the last is a, a product called Mammoth P, which is a phosphorus chelating uh, microbe that helps make much more phosphorus that's already available. There's already phosphorus in your aquaponics system that the, the fish produce, but it, it kind of unlocks a lot more of it uh, to be plant mm -hmm. available. Um, totally fish safe. You can use it as much as you want. But it's just one of those things where, just going back to what you're saying, where you know once we we're able to map out all these different microbes and what they do and what they're part of the food web, rather than just nitrospira and nitrosoma, um, mm -hmm. and you know getting way more down the rabbit hole um, and making sure that those are provided, and then eventually you know there will be microbial products that are derived from that based on you know what we discover from all that. Um, and it, it is a huge area of research, especially in aquaponics, that just has hasn't been touched on hardly at all. Agreed, agreed. And that's that's really, you know, with with things like the, the Food Safety Modernization Act, the FSMA, with the requirements that that major wholesale buyers, uh, you know, Whole Foods, HEB, Albertsons, Kroger, that they have on producers to have GAPS certifications and various uh, biosafety protocols and so forth. It, it's going to become critical that we as an industry know exactly how our systems work on the biological level, not at the grand scale, not, well, waste gets processed into fertilizer. You know, that's great, but we need to know how it works. And bottom line, it's a business. If, if you can add supplement A that will increase the efficiency of utilization of what's already in your system, or you add supplements B, C, D, and E because you have to provide those same nutrients in a form that the plants can can utilize. You know, it, it's cost. If mm -hmm. you add if you add the first one once, or you add the others monthly, weekly, you know, you're gonna you're gonna make more money if you do it the most efficient way. And that's mm -hmm. that's the bottom line with business is we have to be profitable. So. That's that's where our industry needs to go from a commercial perspective. Now, is all that oh, yeah. necessary? Is that necessary for the guy who wants to grow in his backyard to provide food for his family? No, of course not. But the goals are different. So yeah. when I when I teach students, when I when I teach classes or talk to people, that's in the end that's what I always come back to is one aquaponics isn't going to save the world. It's a great tool. It's a great 
Yeah, the um, opportunities, but it's not going to solve every solution. And if you know what you want, then you can design a system to reach that goal. But you have to design the system that meets the goal you have, not who's telling you their system or their design or their whatever is the solution you need. Because in the end, you really should learn how to design it yourself. Whether you're building an IBC tote system or 40,000 square foot of, of commercial production. Now, um, with that being said, what are some of the more common issues or um, stumbling blocks or other, um, you know, I guess things you run into working with people that are trying to get started? <laughs> um, common stumbling blocks. Uh, let's see. The number one that I have is is people have this romantic um, idea of of being a farmer of of producing your own food and so forth, and that it's all green hillsides and the red barn, and you know you just go out and you plant a couple seeds and then you come back and you have luscious produce ready to harvest. Farming isn't it's not a job. It's it's a calling. It's a desire. It is it is more work than I've done in any other career I've had, and that's saying a lot from a history of at one time being a ditch digger, being construction worker, commercial fisherman. I I do more work as a farmer than I've done in anything else, and people need to learn that that romantic notion of just go plant a seed and then come back later and harvest it, it doesn't work that way. So that's that's the number one thing. And then the next one that would be right under that would probably be the people spend too much time surfing YouTube or reading books or magazines or this or that, and they want to create this utopian image of a self-sufficient system. They have their compost and their worms and their black soldier flies and solar panels and anaerobic digesters. And then they want to be able to do aquaponics and harvest fish, but breed their own fish. And, and they design this, this image in their head that has 20,000 moving parts that they don't know how to do a single one of. And they think they can just put it into motion and it's going to run itself. So when I work with when I work with with students or or with clients, I always say, okay, that that's your your ten year vision. That's where you want to be in ten years. Now let's move that back in phases. And when you start day one, you're going to pay for all of your inputs. You're going to pay for all your power, all your water, so forth. And every year you're just going to add another piece onto this design to get to your vision. But you can't start with with complex. You would just you set yourself up for failure at that point. Yeah, that's definitely something that I've seen quite a few times where people have you know just get way too complicated and just like you're saying, they don't have a a real good understanding of how the whole system fits together, and then they try and you got to get you know at least your bread and butter down before you can start making a souffle. You know, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, simply put, I've been doing this professionally, semi-professionally now for eight, almost nine years. And I learn, <laughs> I learn new things daily, if not several. Oh, I shouldn't do that. Or, you know, I really need to do it this way. Or, oh, look, here's a paper on filtration that I've never heard of. And that's going to change how I design my radial flow uh, solid separator. I mean, just much information out there that you could spend months on a particular facet and not even master that facet. The, the idea that somebody can come into aquaponics with, you know, never even keeping a fish tank in their house and then can all of a sudden go out and, and open up a, a 5,000 square foot commercial farm when not only have they never grown a plant, they've never kept a fish, and they've never owned a business, but they think they can be a farmer. 
and it, people laugh at me every time I say that I've talked more people out of being a commercial aquaponic uh, business owner than I've ever taken on as clients or, or even had go on on their own to do it. I don't think my personal opinion is that the aquaponics industry is too young to really have that, that depth of vision to know what is really necessary. Um, we, we have some great farms that are out there being run by some really wonderful, knowledgeable people um, who are willing to share their information. But then we've also had some rather spectacular failures that have left some pretty nasty black eyes on our industry. And once again, that's why I personally think that to get past this and to really develop this as a commercial industry, we've got to start talking to each other. We've got to start working with each other. We've got to start sharing information. You know, the, this idea of proprietary secrets in aquaponics is just kind of silly to me because it's there. I mean, with hydroponics, I totally understand that you can have a proprietary nutrient solution formula. You can have lighting schedules and you can have all of this that is very proprietary. It's very distinct, but for aquaponics, it's just not the same. We don't have the same old control over our systems that you do with hydro. So if we talk to each other, if we share, I mean, a farm where you are in California is never going to compete with a farm in Texas or a farm in Florida or a farm in New York state for market share. They're never going to compete. So why not have those people work together, talk to each other and learn from each other's mistakes so they don't all have to make the same mistakes. That's the reason that I ran to be ran for chairman of the Aquaponics Association. And, and that's why I've done this for the last eight years is I want to help people succeed. You know, I mean, that's, that's the purpose. That's the reason. So that's, that's where we need to go is we just need to start helping each other more. Yeah, I know. I've definitely, <clears throat> especially when I was back working at the aquaponic source, received a couple, you know, phone calls from people or, Oh, I have like 4,000 square feet of lettuce and uh, I have no idea why it's turning yellow. And, you know, they had no, ex no one had ever explained pH to them. They had no idea what <laughs> iron, you know, iron dosing and all these things. And it's like, well, how did you get to the point between like wanting to do this and then owning an active system with that many heads of lettuce and then not ever trying to learn the chemistry? And it just blew me away. You, there's no other industry that I've ever worked with or seen where people like literally think that they can just dive in with with no training or background and just try and do something, you know, on an enormous mm -hmm. scale. Um, We've had, I had calls people spraying their plants with window cleaner to kill insects. <laughs> I've had like you, like all uh, OxyClean to clean the dirt out of the sumps, like ridiculous things where you're just like, what on earth are you thinking? Um, have you had any um, particularly comical or noteworthy calls that have come your way? Um, yes. Uh, yes. I mean, of course. Uh, most of which I, I end up hanging up the phone and just shaking my head in confusion <laughs> slash disbelief. Um, and, and I mean, I could come up with, with a list, but, but most were similar to the ones that you just described, but, but one, I do remember one, um, a guy called me and <laughs> he said, okay, I have, he had some like massive acreage and so forth and he could put up whatever he wanted out there. And my brother has a good friend who needs to buy onions. So I want to grow colossal onions in my aquaponic system. And he wanted to grow, apparently a colossal onion is like a, it's like a pound and a half to two pound, like sweet yellow onion. It's a colossal, it's a size grade apparently. Mm -hmm. But he's like, okay, I want to be able to grow 20,000 pounds of onions every quarter. And I was like, okay go buy a tractor, you know, that there's no reason. <laughs> there's absolutely no reason for you to do this in aquaponics. And 
he stops for a second and I can hear him pausing and he comes back, but I've already built the greenhouse and the deep water troughs. How do I grow onions in that? You know, it's just like, well, yeah. you, I, I didn't even know how to respond to him. I mean, it just, and it, it goes back to what I was saying. It's, it's that romantic notion of, well, I'll be a farmer. I can grow it. You know, it, I, I forget who I heard. I forget if it was Rob Nash or Ryan Chatterson or maybe it was Elise, uh, TC Winks. Um, but one of them said years ago, and, and we all say it now, is that, you know, you'll never make any money growing plants or fish. You'll never make a dime if you sell plants and fish. If you want to run mm -hmm. a commercial facility, you need to know how you're going to distribute and sell and at what price your product before you even consider need, before you build the system, before you plant a seed. If you don't know how you're going to sell your product, why even go into business? If there's, you can grow all the lettuce you want, but if nobody wants to buy lettuce, it's worthless. So yep. there's so many things that can go wrong with, with this industry. I really take it as, as a personal mission to help people get the information they need to make the right choices. You know, like I said before, whether you're doing soil or hydro or it doesn't really matter. There's, you can grow food with all of them. You can grow the same food with all of them. But what's best for you, that's what makes your choice for you. You know, sometimes it's budget. Sometimes it's environment. Sometimes <laughs> it's growing onions. You know, it's, <laughs> you just got to make the right choice and the most efficient choice. Yeah, it's definitely the number one thing I tell people, especially when I get a customer that wants to do vegetables, is before you build anything, Go talk to your local chefs, talk to your local CSAs, talk to your local food pantry, go talk to your local restaurants, find out what people want. You know, what is, they everyone might just want you to grow spinach or broccoli shoots or, you know, basil or rosemary or mm -hmm. whatever. Like, oh, basil, cater to what you're thinking. One. Basil. Everybody wants to grow basil. Every, it seems like every third person I talk to, well, I can just grow basil. It sells for $15, $20 a pound. Well, yes, it does, but if you have seven farms in an area that are all growing basil, guess what? It's going to be $4 a pound because there's yep. too much of it. You, you yep. have to find a market need. Basil is a pound. Yeah, the biggest growing thing is growing pounds. stuff out of season for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, you know, in, in Colorado, in northern New Mexico, in in Minnesota, Michigan, whatever. If you can grow basil during the winter, this is growing it, you might get $25 a pound, you know, because nobody else can get it. And crops like basil don't ship very well. But if you're, yep. if you're in central Texas and you're trying to grow tomatoes, well, guess what? Everybody's growing tomatoes during the summer. Hell, in central Texas, everybody's growing tomatoes 12 months out of the year. But, <laughs> but the point is, is that Aquaponics, hydroponics, these are more expensive ways to farm. It costs more per unit to do aquaponics or hydroponics. The only way you're going to make any money is if you're selling a higher quality product into a niche market or into a market that is off season. You know, uh, Rob Nash and I were talking at the conference that he was, he was real close to to, to find a deal to sell his lettuce in a grocery store. And then he came back two weeks later and there was a new lettuce that a new hydroponic lettuce that was coming in from Mexico. It was two heads of lettuce for 99 cents. There's not any possible way that he or any of us doing aquaponics could compete with, with that price point selling yeah. retail two heads of lettuce in a clamshell at 99 cents. I mean, there's no way. So you have to know your market. You have to know what people are willing to pay and what volume they're willing to buy. 
The the one notable exception of that would be the cannabis industry, just because of how much, how long it takes to grow and how much extra water you you end up using um, for for hydroponics versus aquaponics. Any other yeah, longer and- term crops, some of those can be a a little bit cheaper to do AP versus hydro, but it really depends mm-hmm. on you know, the, the growth time. That, and that's true. And, and from a, from an individual harvest point, I mean, I'll, I'll be the first to admit, I don't know a whole lot about the cannabis industry, but it's still going to suffer from the same potential issues that Mm -hmm. a food, that a food crop would. Because legalization of recreational and, and medicinal production, so forth, that there's going to be eventually maximum number of producers that can hit that yep. top that top dollar price and as more and more people go into that industry because of let's be honest that incredibly lucrative price point yep the more people you have producing it, it's supply and demand the more supply the lower the cost mm-hmm. so so I, it's going to happen but due to the 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 gloriously elevated price point it will take a while before people start really losing their shirt that it? indeed <laughs> um is there any other um is there any particular varieties you suggest for people that are getting started that um you know you've had a lot of success with or is there any um particular uh um fish that uh species aside from tilapia that you've had a lot of success with <laughs> um honestly when it comes to fish sometimes especially for small scale producers like backyarders and such and family producers i tell them to go with goldfish and koi fish because they're more resilient they're cheaper to feed they handle hot temperatures cold temperatures they you know they're just they're they're um I actually usually try to talk people away from tilapia because once again, it seems like the people that come to me always have the, that they can buy like six tilapia once and then breed them on their own from then on and never have to buy another fingerling. So I usually, yeah, maybe more bluntly than I probably should, but I usually tell them the realities of what it takes to actually breed fish consistently. And mm-hmm. then they, then they look at doing something else, or or just buying tilapia fingerlings. <laughs> but I mean, tilapia are good. They're 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 fast growing. There's a reason they're the most commonly cultured fish. But but bluegill are great. Catfish are great. Um, trout, striped bass, things like that take a lot more skill. But there's a lot of fish out there that can be done. Plants. Uh, my my daughter's vegetarian. My wife loves eating salad a lot, so we grow lots and lots of lettuce. So various types of lettuce and such. I'm always I, every year when the Johnny's seed catalog comes out and the Baker Creek seed catalog comes out, I always end up buying sixty seventy dollars worth of of lettuce seeds and so forth. And we just try new varieties every year. Um. Okay, so here's one. I haven't had any success with it. And if, if anybody out there knows how to be successful with this variety of tomato, please tell me because favorite, but I can't I, I can't get great yields from it. Um it came I got it from the Baker Creek catalog uh two years ago. It's a, it was produced by actually a company out in California, I think out near you, Steve. Um have you ever heard of uh wild boar farms, uh tomato farms? No. Um, they're he's breeding new varieties of heirloom tomatoes. Um, and they're some of them are gorgeous. Um, but he has uh it's a blue purple tomato. It's called an indigo apple. Um it's like a four to five, maybe a six ounce tomato. So it's not quite a beef steak, but it's about twice the size of a cherry. Um and they're just gorgeous. They've got they ripen. They've got a nice red uh, belly on the tomato, but it, it darkens into a, a purple so dark it's almost black on the shoulders. It's just gorgeous, and it's got a great flavor to it. But I can't get yields. You know, I get pounds off of a plant 
over the course of the season. I don't get the tomatoes that I want. So what are your gotta, uh, What are you doing for potassium supplementation? Um, potassium. Um, we do uh, uh, pH supplement uh, with uh, potassium bicarb and potassium carbonate, and then we do. Um, I'll do a foliar spray every now and then, but no, basically just just bicarbs for to bring our pH back sure. up. You um, depending on whether or not you're organically certified, uh, certified, you can also do um, potassium sulfate or potassium chloride. Just don't go okay. completely crazy with the chloride. Um, yeah, to I, get a, I, like, I try boost. to keep chlorides out of my system as much as possible because we've got a fair amount in the water here, but. Okay. Yeah. Not everywhere has them. I know here I'm on well water where I'm at, we have zero chlorides in the water. And actually for those that don't know, chloride is actually a, you need a minimum amount of chloride for photosynthesis mm -hmm. to take place. Um, so maintaining a 60 to 80 chloride parts per million chloride in your water will have zero effect, negative impact on your microbials or your fish. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. As fish can survive up to 180 actually with comfortably before the EPA. I think it's 200 is the EPA cut off. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the only caveat on that, though, is if you have chloride in combination with sodium in your water, then then yes. that can cause problems. But if you have no sodium, you can have a, a actually a quite elevated chloride level without any issues. Yep. Plus, chloride usually off gases relatively quickly if it ends up in the in the upper end of your range, just through, you know, if you have air stones in the system or water moving. So. That's true. That's true. But yeah, I mean, but, uh, as far as the tomatoes go, it, it's not that like I'm getting blossom drop or anything, and it's not that the fruit are are small or right. undersized. It's just I don't get many flowers. It's not producing. I don't know, and so maybe maybe that's the question. If anybody out there has grown the indigo tomato variety, do do you get small numbers of flowers, or do you get massive flowers? Because I don't, you know. Like on my yellow pears and so forth, I'll get mm -hmm. I'll get like three hundred flowers across the plant. On my indigo mm -hmm. apples, I'll get like ten. So it, it's oh. it's odd. So it's I get a good fruit set percentage. Um, I'll, I'll probably get a ninety percent uh, fruit set on the flowers, but mm -hmm. I just I don't get many flowers. One of the other. One of the other nutrients I noticed, especially with the last farm that I was working at, that we used a lot with the tomatoes and had a lot of success with was um, uh, for switching uh, at least one of our, you know, alternating between the potassium carbonate um, based uh, buffers and then a pota uh, potassium silicate, which added to the silica. Yeah. And that also seems to help with um, tomatoes, especially with tomatoes uh, and cucumbers resisting um, uh, powdery mildew and other molds. Um, okay. You know, once they hit a certain age, sometimes it can be kind of tricky to keep it off of them, and uh, yeah. it really, uh, uh, really helps a lot with reducing that. Okay. Yeah, you and I talked about um, silicates. Uh, what was it? A month ago or so. Um, definitely next season, mm -hmm. um, we'll look into doing some some trials and experiments with that, and, and actually try to get some 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 information that we can release and put out publicly. But no, I haven't tried silicates yet. No, that's that's next on my list. Yeah, maintaining a silica level between eighty and one hundred and twenty parts per million will dramatically both reduce both heat stress and uh, on tomatoes and other crops, as well as um, uh, helping with disease resistance. Like dramatically, it really makes a night and day difference. At least in especially in a higher humidity environment like aquaponics, we've noticed a huge, mm -hmm. huge benefit to it, and it has no negative impact. You can't overdose on silicates. There, you can't find a picture on Google of a plant that's overdosed, and nor have I ever. I mean, I've run closed loop systems of two years, dumping silicates into it every week, just about, and uh, you know, still haven't managed to achieve any kind of toxicity level where anything looked like it was hurting. So, and we have some systems that are flirting with 200 parts per million silica. So, wow, yeah, that's pretty. <laughs> yeah, it just doesn't seem to harm anything, um, you know, unless you have it. Uh, you know, sky, sky high, but it's pretty hard because of the low availability. You really have to go out of your way to hit that. So, yeah, well, that's cool. I will certainly look into that. I'll let you know what I find out when I get there. All right on. Well, uh, anything, uh, anything to join us today? 
Yeah, it, this was a blast. I appreciate it, and thanks for thanks for inviting me on. Uh, I really do appreciate it. Yeah, again in the future, and uh, uh, thanks for taking the time to tell us about your different methods. Um, for those of you wanting to to get a hold of him, you can reach him at uh, greenphoenixfarms.com. And um, I don't know, feel free to to uh, plug anything else. I think you also teach some classes or workshops, and you do a bunch of other other things. So um, they can reach you through there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, finding me through greenphoenixfarms.com is probably the the absolute best way to do it. Um, just if you don't mind a, a quick plug, with the new year, we are going to be launching um, our own line of uh, mineral supplements for aquaponics. So uh, Very cool. that will there's some information on the website now, but the website's going to undergo a, a complete and total redesign in the next three weeks. So come back at the at the start of the new year and if you have a question we'll be here to help you answer it if we can't answer it we'll send you to somebody who can so thanks for having me here and uh i haven't heard any aquaponic specific stuff so it's really nice to hear well it, it's always fun to talk to people who actually know what they're talking about so it, it's been it's been fun steve i appreciate it appreciate it thank you all right, have a good night. All right, guys, I'm going to, uh, it was really nice having him on. Um, I have a couple announcements, and then I'm going to go on to a rant, and then hopefully Marty will be joining us here in the next 10 to 15 minutes. Um, of, uh, a C um, so there's a, we're working on having a California event in Southern California um, near San Diego. Um, later in the year, sometime after July, uh, we'll have more information on that. Um, but it'll be a joint event with another uh, group of people that um, uh, just waiting on more details before I can make a wider announcement. But definitely plan on coming out to Southern California the second half of the year. Um, wanting to, uh, yeah, I'll have more information soon. But uh, Mark, save the date. Um, We'll be teaching uh, classes here up in um, uh, Ouroboros. Uh, we have some more dates. Um, we'll be teaching aquaponic cannabis class in January, March, uh, January 21st and 22nd. Um, we'll, the next one will be March 25th and 26th. Uh, then we'll be teaching one in May on the 13th and 14th. We'll be teaching a, another one in July on the 22nd and 23rd. Uh, in August on the 19th and 20th, um, in September on the 23rd and 24th, and October on the 21st and 22nd. Uh, if, you're interested, if you're interested in that, visit aquaponic.com. If you're in, uh, interested in attending the class or have questions on that, um, I'm happy to, uh, happy to announce that. Um, let's see here, make sure we don't have any live questions. No, Marty, Marty didn't take uh, as a question in chat marty didn't take off he just had a uh a fam um and will be joining us here any minute um he just had something that popped up last minute um so one thing i wanted to touch on today i'm not going to name the company but um there was a company that approached us that is a more prominent aquaponics company wanted to be on the show has posted a couple of things on the aquaponic facebook group and then Today, they were going to be our other guests on the show, and they decided that they didn't want to be on the show because they didn't want to be associated with cannabis. Um, the guy's just not going to be on the show, and he got removed from the group. Um, I don't have time for that crap. Like, if you're going to waste my time and try and use this for advertising and use this to promote your stuff, like, come on the show and don't discriminate against us. Um, we have to deal with that discrimination as an aquaponic cannabis business, this radio show and everything else. I don't need people that are just going to do that kind of crap. So um, that really, you know, there's a lot of discrimination that still goes on. This is even like, uh, uh, this is just one little tiny piece of it. You know, this is kind of ridiculous that in the modern age, and it's really funny for me as someone who's very jaded, um, when I get to, when I leave other, to go to other less than legal states, when I'm flying through them, um, to like forget that like people can't just go do this that or the other or go to their local you know even 
garden people can't just go to the local grocery store. You know, there isn't a local hydro store or a local grocery store um, like there is in the, even the, the, the cannabis legal states, the medical estates, you know, that they just don't have access to the same types of nutrients even for their own garden. Um, it gets kind of frustrating. And uh, I don't know. I just uh, that really upset me, and uh, I don't know. We're not going to f- do that in the future. <laughs> we're going to make sure people that are, are willing to come on the show if they're going to do advertising or not even advertising because we don't take any paid advertisements. But uh, you know, wanting to come on the show to promote their stuff, um, you know, it's just not going to happen. So we had a couple of um, big news announcements this week. Um, thanks to the DEA dipshits. Um, for those of you that missed it, the DEA went through today, or on uh, the 13th, when was that, Tuesday? Yeah, Tuesday. And they classified all cannabinoids, only cannabinoids derived from cannabis, mind you. So if it's from hemp or cannabis, it's it's now legal. But if it's from, you know any number of other plants that produce cannabinoids and is isolated, there's no issue. Um, They banned all, made all cannabinoid derivatives schedule one, whereas previously they had not been included under that. Um, So now no more mailing terpenes through the mail, no more mailing cannabinoids through the mail, no more CBD in legal states, no more hemp CBD, no more CBD that's legal in all 50 states, no more mailing any of that crap. Uh, this is the biggest fucking douchebag asshole move the DEA has literally ever fucking made. You have millions of fucking people across this country that are relying on this day in and day out for cancer treatment, seizure treatment. Like so many children are being used using CBD oil right now just to treat their, their epilepsy. And these fucking douchebags want to come in and take away some child's medicine that's stopping their seizure. Fuck you, dude. Fuck you. You're big like and if any fucking DA dipshit's listening, fuck you, dude. You're a piece of shit. There's no fucking reason to directly attack only medical patients. By only medical patients are affected by the C B D ruling. Like that's like going into a hospital and telling about opioids and that we're now gonna revoke all of it and fuck your pain, fuck your seizures, fuck your the fact that you just had surgery. None of that matters. You're gonna sit there and suffer because we're we're dipshits who are more knowledgeable on that shit than, than you are. And we, oh no, you're just making shit up. Like d- d- never before have I ever seen something that was so cruel. Um, I'm going to go off on a rant, a personal rant. So I have a cousin and my sister both fuck for a seizure disorder. Um, a cousin of mine has epilepsy. He discovered he had epilepsy when he was, he, he had never had epilepsy before. He's was in his upper thirties, was driving a truck at work, suddenly had a seizure, crashed his truck, got in a horrible car accident because he was having a seizure while driving and um, ended up moving to Colorado. And he, um, cannabis is the only thing that stops his seizures. He's tried I don't know, at least 18 different medications for his seizures and none of them worked. None of them did anything. You know, they they might have a mild response, but they stopped working after six or eight months. You know, cannabis oil has stopped his seizures for four years straight. He's had two seizures in four years and that was right when he started taking the medication. He started taking cannabis oil. Okay. And he only takes CBD oil. No, no psychoactive THC, just CBD oil. My sister has a vaccine-related seizure disorder. She was given a medical-grade flu shot for a hospital, collapsed, didn't wake up for 13 fucking days, and now has a seizure disorder after getting the flu shot. Now, whether or not you want to argue with me about whether or not the flu shot caused it is another story, but she didn't have it three minutes beforehand, and, and after that, she's had it since then, and she didn't have it at all the whole, whole life. It, just, it was an immune system response. Um, the, again, she has taken a bunch of different medications. The only thing that has worked is CBD medication. Okay. To tell both of them that they are not allowed to get it, better yet, even have access to the isolate, is the, like, fuck you, dude. I will personally make that shit for both of them. Like, this is fucking crazy. There is no a goddamn reason in the world other than stupid, greedy dipshits at pharmaceutical companies trying to fucking 
take this away, take a medication that works for thousands, not even thousands, millions of Americans right now are using this and they're going to take it away just because of greed. Like that's fucking completely insane. Uh, another thing that I want to touch on, because and I think I'm going to mention this once before, and it's something I have a hard time talking about without getting choked up. The for, there was a customer back when I worked at the aquaponics source who came in and had never never tried cannabis before. They had just moved to the state. They had been in the state like four days, and they came to us because they wanted to build an aquaponic system to <laughs> to grow medicine for their kid. Um, their kid, um, I will, I'll leave names out of this, but, um, up into his stroller because he could not like walk around and not have a seizure and fall down and he heard it fall down, hurt himself. And he was having between 60 and a hundred and some seizures a day. It was crazy. <laughs> the, the next time I saw that kid was three months later. DVD oil. That kid ran through the store, <laughs> knocking shit off the shelves, you know, running over to the fish tank, wanting to feed the fish, you know, pointing at the fish, pointing at the tomatoes, you know, all that stuff. To take a kid that was like totally in and then give them their kid back. Just through medicine, just through medicine like that, it's the best gift you could give anybody. And the DEA is denying people that right to get their fucking kids back and to get their family members back. And it's the most anger fucking inducing thing on the planet like that's just beyond fucked up i'm sorry for getting emotional but like god fucking damn it and the other thing is is they're not banning cannabinoids blanketly they're banning cannabinoids only derived from from uh medical cannabis or from hemp which is completely fucking ridiculous you know it's a chemical compound you know lsd made from a guy in a basement is is no different than LSD made from a guy in a fucking laboratory. It's LSD. LSD is LSD. You know what? There's no difference from that. There's no other reg medic. There's no other, you know, industry that's regulated like this. This is completely fucking insane. Better yet, one that fucking has the literally, literally the ability to transform people's fucking lives. You know, this is just completely fucking insane. It's complete fucking bullshit. And there's no goddamn reason for it. It's not based on science. It's based on fucking greed and bullshit. Um, we have a couple. Sorry, we have a couple people in chat. I didn't mean to leave you guys out. Um, <laughs> this ganja guy says CBD is the devil. Uh, wait, so I can't buy EMU four twenty CBD rub at the dispenser anymore? Yeah. So all. All extracts and isolates are now are classified as Schedule One um, uh, felonies. Uh, even do isolates now, which is completely fucking psychotic. Um, <clears throat> we have another guy. This is uh, I'm over legal cannabis uh, industry. I was feeling optimistic about things changing in Texas, but not anymore. Corruption has reared its ugly head. Uh, call me stupid, but I grow <laughs> aquaponics. Um, the, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, you do have some states that are wanting to pass, you know, millions of dollars, you know, I know there's one state that wants to charge a, like a $10 million pay to play, um, tax fee just to be able to even attempt to get it. Um, which is one of the, the states that, that was mentioned in chat here. Um, but just like no more terpenes through the mail either. That's all illegal and the new and the new ruling as well which is again completely fucking asinine because you can drink a gallon of terpenes you could smoke a gallon of terpenes it won't do shit i mean it'll do some stuff to you but it ain't gonna kill you in any way shape or form um but for them to, to directly attack literally something that is only medicinally beneficial uh, is just the most cruel heartless 
douchebag fucking thing I have ever seen in my entire life. And sorry to go off on a total of crazed rant about this shit and to get all emotional, but like, there's no fucking reason for this shit. It's completely asinine. It's completely uncalled for. And there's no reason for it. There, there hasn't been a single case of someone taking CBD oil and dying CBD oil and having a negative medical um, event or anything even close to the sort. In fact, just the fucking opposite has happened 90% of the time. Yeah, you have a few unscrupulous CBD makers. And yes, there is there is a lot of snake oil out there. And it does need to have some level of regulation. But banning it and making it Schedule 1, when we know for a goddamn fact, you can go on YouTube and find a thousand videos of people that are just within two or three minutes, their seizures stop, they start talking again, they start moving again, this, that, or the other, you know, that is the absolute, uh, to make an argument that it's not medical is the most bullshit, bold-faced fucking lie on the planet. Um, and, you know, shit like this is, just, I don't even know what to start. Like, if, if this is what we're gonna deal with the next four years, I'm just gonna go to the Caribbean. This whole market has gotten so frustrating to deal with uh, especially after this like, last election with the, the investor, um, everyone being terrified about Trump and Mike Pence, uh, not Mike Pence, um, what the fuck is his name? Um, uh, the new uh, secretary. Anyways, uh, there's just no reason for this shit. And now they're going to go and attack it? You know, it, uh, there's just no... Uh, I just I don't even know what to say anymore. These guys are fucking assholes, and there's there's no other. You're just a cruel piece of shit if you fucking don't want a kid to to have their medication. There's really no two ways about it, you know. And you stutter, you know. Send them video of that and say, look, you're a cruel piece of shit. You're literally just taking away a kid's ability to to, to remove their seizures from their life. There's there's no reason for any of this crap, you know. This is psychotic. What the hell is wrong with you? You know, do you, if your child, you know, I, I this, here's a question I have for the, the director of the DEA. If your child had grand mal seizures, would you stop to have CBD oil just because your own organization says it's not okay? Or would you solve your kids' seizures? I want to know that question. Guarantee you all of us know the answer to that question. He'd give his kid the fucking oil. You know, this is fucking ridiculous. Anyways, I'm going to get off the podium on that. Um, I did want to touch on, uh, we're just starting some cold weather crops out here. I'll have some video of that. Um, for those of you that are not doing cannabis or doing some cooler weather stuff uh, and have colder weather tolerant fish, um, lettuce, uh, cabbages, radishes, kohlrabi, broccoli, kale, um, you know, a lot of your leafy greens, mustard greens, all of those are great things that you can plant if you're in a not, you know, brutal climate. We're here in Southern California, so we're a little spoiled. But uh, all those can take, you know, pretty mild frost down to about 26, 28. Um, and uh, we have grown, and I'll have some video footage of you guys, for you guys. Um, I'm not uh, still waiting on Marty. I'm not sure if he's going to end up joining us today. Um, he had a, a last-minute family thing, and... Uh, I'll, they'll either join us here at the end or uh, um, we'll, we'll catch him next time. Um, yeah, um, I'm going to wrap things up. We have a kind of a lot going on here where I'm at today at the farm. And uh, off and upset about this DEA ruling. Um, really huge thanks to uh, Adam Cohen for coming out uh, from Green Phoenix Farms. Um, really take, appreciate him taking the time to talk to us and uh, talking about the Aquaponics Association. Um, I was hoping to get a chance to go out to their last meeting, but it did, didn't get a chance to. Uh, but I do really appreciate him taking the time to uh, to join us and give us in insight. And um, very great having him on the show. Um, we have a couple. We have a question. Uh, in chat, agree, Fishka.
Oh, Fish, um, there's a question in chat. It says, who do you think is pulling the strings of the DEA, Big Pharma? Yeah, absolutely Big Pharma is. Uh, cannabis is one of the largest threats to the pharmaceutical industry. It's a painkiller. It's a digestive aid. It is a seizure suppressant. It's a cancer drug. It is a whole bunch of things that are their bread and butter every day. Oh, take a pill until you die income. And it's a direct threat to all of that. It's, it's much safer for people than any of those things. You know, almost any medication you take that you're supposed to take for the rest of your life will have a negative impact on your kidney or your liver 90% of the time. You know, it, it's complete bullshit. Whereas cannabis has no negative, you know, very little negative impact, especially if you do vaporizing or, or other or edibles. Um, you know, very little to no negative impact on your body compared to all these other medications that both cost a lot more. Uh, and have a you know much bigger health impact, or they want to give you a pill for the symptoms, and they want to give you a pill for the side effects of that, and suddenly you're taking six pills instead of one when you only have one problem. You know it's it's ridiculous. So that's what this all goes back to. It's the same bullshit, different day. Um. Uh, yeah. So um, well um, you know, check out the classes at aquachronic.com if you're interested in taking a class. We'll have more. Um, locations and to announce outside of San Francisco here soon um, once I finish nailing all those down shortly and um, we'll be teaching some other classes uh, up at Ouroboros some advanced and some herbal classes up there as well um, I think the dates either uh, quite, haven't been posted yet but um, as soon as we have the dates I'll post those and I uh, appreciate everyone for joining us today sorry it's a little bit different format um, Marty wasn't able to join us but um, I appreciate you all taking the time to join us today. Visit me at a comment or anything else. Always feel free to email me at potentponics at gmail.com. And uh, check out the website, potentponics.com. YouTube is potentponics. Um, Marty's is um, AP Meds. Uh, he wasn't, um, he's normally with us. And um, uh, the Facebook group is Aquaponic Cannabis Growers. We do a lot of talk and chat in there. Um, oh, we did have one question from there earlier. Hold on. Um, oh, just about the organic issues. I did a much better job of explaining that than I did. Um, cool. All right. Yeah. Um, thanks for joining us uh, again. Uh, Potent at Gmail. If you have any questions and um, thanks for joining us. Have a great one.